Good morning, everybody. God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. Two fantastic readings today from the Gospel of Luke. And the first concerns Zechariah, who is a priest in the temple. And he's a guy who's been doing what he's been doing for loads and loads of years. And he does it in the same way. And perhaps his expectation of what God can do is pretty small. Do you recognize that? How would you describe your expectation of what God can do? Hesitant. <laughs> it's encouraging, isn't it? Well, you know. But that's true, isn't it? I mean, our expectation of who God is, what God can do, can be really small. And here is Zechariah, who was a priest after all. He's supposed to be one of those who is full of what God can do. But he's lost that expectation and then God comes to him and bam, everything changes and he's promised that his son is going to be a prophet who will prepare the way for Jesus to come. And how would you feel if you'd had such low expectation and then God chooses you to do something amazing and to be part of what God's up to? How would you feel? Humble. Yeah, I mean, I'd feel a right Burke, you know, and it's, it's happened more times than I care to remember because God does this, doesn't he? God surprises us all the time with what God's going to do. And so poor Zechariah, he's humble, but also he loses his voice. He can't speak. Now, last year I lost my voice because I had bronchitis and it damaged one of the nerves to the vocal cords. Thankfully, the one that's slightly shorter than the really long one, which would have meant it wasn't just nine months I couldn't preach for, it would have been even longer. But for nine months, I couldn't preach. Imagine what that is like. You're saying, please, Lord, bring it again. <laughs> Silence him, Lord. But for nine months, I couldn't preach. And then I was signed off to go back to preaching by the consultant. And I have to tell you, it was like a bomb going off. There was so much I wanted to say. Ah, come on, and you can still see, I have that sense of passion to say what is on my heart to say about God. Because when you've been silenced and then you can speak, you speak with conviction and you say what matters most, don't you? You really get down to it. And that's what Zechariah does. He looks like a man transformed, totally different. You wouldn't recognise it was the same person. And yet here he is, and he has his big moment, and he speaks with amazing conviction. And he says it as it is. He is unbound. The fetters are off. Nothing is going to stop Zechariah from saying what God has given him to say. He's not scared anymore. He's not looking over his shoulder. He's not worried what the religious authorities think. More to the point, he ain't worried about what Rome thinks, the big dominant power. He's not worried about the high priests who make them toe the line. He is going to say it as it needs to be said. Faith unbound. And that's your calling and mine, to speak with faith unbound. So what would that look like tomorrow morning? When you're doing whatever you're doing, and God releases you to speak into the need of the world and those around you, unbound and unfettered. Well, look at what Zechariah says, and that's what it looks like. Because he talks about liberation. He talks about freedom for the oppressed. He digs deep into his belief and he just says it. That what God is going to do is going to set you free because God is offering forgiveness for sins and the freedom that comes from it. And it's a moment of great Theological clarity is that because he recognises that his son, John, 
who is going to be the prophet who's preparing the way, he is going to be the one who is actually going to get to grips with that and help people own that forgiveness in a way that sets them free and which changes the world, its politics, its relationships at the same time. Now, you may think I'm bonkers. That's not a rhetorical question, <laughs> by the way. But it, I'm not, and neither's John, and neither's Zechariah. Because the world is only going to change, no Zechariah, if we know the depth of God's love for us in the place where we think we're most unlovable. When we accept the mercy of God, who just loves us passionately, then and only then will we feel the transforming forgiveness and be set free. Because then and only then, when you know you're loved absolutely and passionately, can you then love others in that way. Only when you know that you've been forgiven, that in your brokenness and the mess, God loves you. In your beauty and potential, God loves you. Only then, when you've accepted that, can you then treat others in the way that God wants them to be treated. Can you then look at the characters on the video and see them as each one beloved by God? Not a problem to be solved or kept at arm's length, but as a beloved person who God loves and who Jesus died for and God wants to reach out to. So it's a work of great theological beauty and power that Zechariah gives us. And he proclaims liberation. He doesn't care anymore what Rome thinks. He doesn't care what the temple authorities think. He doesn't care what the church thinks. In that moment, he is unbound and his voice proclaims it. Prepare the way. And he ends it with a statement that anybody can understand. You don't need a degree in theology, folks. Because he uses language which everybody gets. And bearing in mind, this guy's voice has just come back. And he finishes this statement with words which ring down the years for us. And they are these. And he says to us, turn it over, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. It bursts out of him, tender mercy of God. That's who God is, full of tender mercy. And Zechariah wants us to know that. We need not be afraid because the God who is a God of tender mercy, that love will break upon us like the dawn to give light to those who sit in the shadows and in darkness. We know what that is like, don't we? And from the depths of his heart, he has now experienced what that means. God has given him hope and it bursts out of him like a dam bursting, it flows out of him and he wants everybody to know it. And that's our task tomorrow, today, that folk would know the tender mercy of God and they would know that love coming like the dawn breaking in the profound darkness to give us hope. Certainly how I felt when my voice came back after nine months of waiting. And when you've waited that long, nothing stops you from wanting people to know that and telling it to them. And then, of course, Zechariah, this fuddy-duddy traditional priest who's always done it the same way, he's transformed and his son comes onto the scene and looks nothing like his dad. Indeed, seems to be rejecting his dad's way of doing stuff. Because John doesn't go to the temple, he doesn't sign up, he doesn't get ordained, he does nothing churchy. John is radical and different and gets to the heart of what God wants. 
Now, Dave, beautifully and wonderfully, you got all the kids out the front. And you may say to yourself, what on earth is Luke doing? Why do we get that annoying, irritating list of names which are hard to pronounce? When actually what we want is at the very end of that list of names. Because what we want is what comes at the end, which is the word of God. And it's as though Luke is just putting this list in our way, but we want the word of God. Come on, Luke, why do you bother with that? Why can't you just say, and John came and he was given the word of God and he preached it. Why give us the list? And yet the list is incredibly important. Because the question that Luke is posing, I think, is this one. It's where do you expect the word of God to come from? Who's got the responsibility to proclaim with conviction unbounded this amazing word of God who loves everybody and wants to transform the whole world? Where do you look? And so he starts with the emperor, Tiberius Caesar. Well, that is risky, isn't it? To say the least. We know what emperors do to those who disagree with them. And it ain't pretty. So Luke starts with the emperor. And it's as though he says, are you looking there? Then he starts with Herod, the puppet king. And then he starts with all the nepotism of Herod's relatives who are governors and they're rulers and they've got this and that. And he shows you the whole socio-political panorama of the time. And he says, and this is what it's like. Are you looking there for God's word of freedom? Radical. And then he goes on to the high priest. You've got Annas and Caiaphas, the religious establishment. And they're listed. They were appointed by Rome, which is a bit dodgy, isn't it? And they're listed. And the question is, and are you looking there? Is that where you're looking to find God's word of freedom? Because the expectation would have been, surely, that that is precisely where you would have looked. Those who have got power should exercise it in a godly way for the benefit of everybody. And Luke is saying, well, you look, <laughs> you look, wherever you look, those who are up there, those who have got status, those who have got power, do you see the word of God setting people free? Answer, no, do you heck? And then at the end of that list, Luke wonderfully powerfully, provocatively, says, and the word of God came to John. Wow. And that John inhabits what Isaiah has said, the message he gives it. And we're told that this is the message the ancient message, which is the engineering of grace at the heart of Advent, if I can put it that way. Prepare a way. It's the great levelling. Those who are up high and the high are brought low. Those who are low are brought up. There is this levelling. The crooked is made straight. In other words, God is saying, nothing gets in the way. If this lot aren't doing it, you do it. I'm calling you to go and gather a people who will bring this message alive of hope for everybody. Wow. The engineering, civil engineering of grace is a task given to us all, here and now, in our time. You could look a bit more excited. <laughs> because this is at the heart of reality. This is God speaking, cutting through all the chaos of Brexit, all the chaos of conflict and far-right populism, all the mess and the misery. It's God cutting through the millions who are leaving Venezuela because that is a place that is going to hell in a handcart economically. Wherever you look, whether you look to Sudan, you look to Yemen, you look to Syria, wherever you look, there is this profound need for God's levelling grace. 
to come and set the people free. And the wonder is God has unbound you and me and given us the courage to proclaim it and be it and do it. So that's the amazing wonder at the heart of Advent. Can we have the first one, please, Ken? And we'll finish with these. So the civil engineering of grace. If you see something's wrong, what do you want to do? Repair it. Put it right. Make it good. Not least because it will cost you if you drive over that and it wrecks your suspension or your tyres or your nice alloys or whatever it is. But you do it so somebody else doesn't have to go through that. Prepare the way. That's the Advent gift and challenge to the church. Next one, Ken, if we could. If you look on the Methodist Church website, you'll see the Advent materials this year are based at uh, the Open Door Refugee and Asylum Seeker Project at Princess Avenue Methodist Church in Hull, which is where I took that shot. Uh, have a look if you haven't seen them. It's a great set of materials for your reflection during Advent. And the stories of people like these two. What is it for the tender mercy of God to break upon these two beautiful people who are made in God's image and for whom the powers do not have a word of freedom? What is it for light to break upon people like that? who sit in darkness. Well, if we've sat in darkness and God's light has shone on us and released us and unbound us, we want them to know it too. Next one, Ken, if you would. Do you recognise the sculpture? It's called The Bachelor's Ashtray by a Polish sculptor I'll get the name wrong, Elena Zorochnipok Zor or something. I apologise to her. She died several years ago and I can't get my, my lips around her surname. But she is a hugely famous Polish sculptor. And this is one of her landmark feminist sculptures. So I went to the Hepworth to see it and photograph it, having seen it uh, in the paper. Profound, it's provocative, it speaks into our time. What do you see? There is sadness. What do you see the artist has done? What's in the top of the here? Yeah, can you see the butts and the ash and the matches stubbed out? What do you think the artist was trying to say? Messing in our heads, abusive women. It's how we see each other, how we treat each other. And we look at that image when a man, a young man in New Zealand has killed a backpacker. And we look at this image and we are challenged about how we look at each other, how we treat each other. It's a me too image. What is it for the tender mercy of God to break upon women who live with that reality. Next one, Ken, could we? I took that one in the centre of Hall, outside Holy Trinity, during City of Culture. That's a homeless guy who has mental health issues. I know that because one of my colleagues saw the image and said, I know him. We work with him at Selby Street Mission. What is it for this guy, with everything that's going on in his life, for the tender mercy of God to break upon him? What is it for the tender mercy of God to break upon the young family in the background who seem carefree and happy? What is it for the tender mercy to break on them? And the last one, Ken, if we could. Isn't he beautiful? He's a little lad from the Middle East sitting in his buggy inside the Open Doors project with his mum 
who was an asylum seeker. And as we look at him, we could be looking at John the Baptist, being held by his dad, Zechariah. And what do you see in his little face? What do you hear? Some of you are smiling, so what do you see? Expectation, trust, you see wonderment, you see the beauty of a human life. He could be John the Baptist. He's from the right part of the world to be that. He's the right sort of age to be held by Zechariah and to be seen as the one in whom God's promise will come alive. And as we look at him, he could be Jesus, born for us and our salvation. So by the tender mercy of God, God challenges us to be unbound with the message of hope and love and expectation that God's love is for each and for all. The great levelling love which sets us free. Thanks be to God.